If you haven't watched my previous video, please do, because it serves as background for this one. Since the last video, I have continued working non-stop on my motion blur effect, and the updates are as follows. I have added better blending heuristics, reducing the smearing in artifacts to a minimum. I have introduced some more variables for better customizability of the blur and added tooltips on everything. I have added a pre-blur processing stage that would let you control how much of each velocity component do you want to contribute to the blur. You have to add it before the blur effect for the blur to work now. This stage also allows you to establish velocity thresholding, which would control how fast does something need to move on your screen before it starts to get blurry. I have added blurring of skyboxes. Finally, I have eliminated some of the biggest performance killers in my code, and while it would still need some work, the performance is much better now. After the clear success that was my last video, I received numerous comments asking about wheels and propellers. While the motion blur effect usually leaves user communities around it divided, propellers and wheels are two of the things that make the most sense to blur regardless, as they usually rotate faster than our eyes can track, and naturally end up appearing blurry as a result. It is clear that creating a believable fast spinning object in a real-time application requires some form of blurring to look good, and there are more than one method to achieve this. But before I continue, you may be asking why I'm not just using the blur I've already worked on so hard and call it a day. After all, it checks all the boxes at a first glance. It captures the motion of each object in the scene, and blurs in between the positions they appear in each frame. It also does it on a per pixel basis, meaning if an object in my view starts rotating, the top of it will be correctly blurred to the right, the bottom will be correctly blurred to the left, and the same for the rest of the object. Based on that, it appears that in theory, I should be able to use the blur effect as is and not mind the difference between an object moving linearly and one that moves angularly, which leaves me free to program other more important features like a disable button. But as much as I would love to let people turn my motion blur off, it would have to wait for now, as rotating elements appear to be the Achilles heel of general real-time motion blur implementations across the board. To understand why, we have to look at an example. So let's look at the best attempt my motion blur makes to process this scene view of a rotating object. That is not right. Let's look at another example, a car speeding down the road. It appears that the wheels are distorted beyond recognition. Here's another example, a propeller speeding up. Not pretty. The reason this is happening is that my motion blur assumes that objects at the time of rendering have moved in a straight line throughout the entire frame along the velocity stored at each pixel in the velocity buffer, and it fills in the gaps based on that assumption, meaning it does not regard whether the object has actually traveled the linear path or not, and based on the information I am feeding it, there is no way for it to do so. This means that when an object follows a curved path, all the motion blur can be aware of is the velocity vector of that object at an instant along that path. It's important to note that there are different ways to set that velocity vector. It is possible to have the velocity vectors be tangent with the path that the object takes, but it would require the use of general linear and angular velocity vectors per object to work. In Godot's case, velocity vectors are based on changes in position rather than the true velocity of the object, meaning the object's velocity vector does not point in a tangent direction to its curved path at that point, but rather where it was positioned along this path in the last frame. Notice how both these estimations never actually follow the path but intersect it at one or more points, thus stay what they are, estimations. Then, when the blur tries to fill in the gaps, it does its best by sampling along that velocity vector, which in most cases estimates the path closely enough to be unnoticeable. But as object velocities become more and more angular, suddenly that estimation falls apart, and you start seeing significant blurring on elements that are part of the rotation stay in the same place. This happens because the faster that an object path curves relatively to its velocity, the faster the rate that this velocity diverges from that path. In my methods case, I am sampling along a velocity that points to where the pixel was last frame. Take into account that propellers on a plane, for example, can spin at speeds upwards of 2000 RPM. At those rates, a propeller may cover more than half a rotation per frame, and while tangent velocity data would be able to capture that, Position-based velocities would start showing the propeller as if it started going in the other direction entirely. This just won't cut it. Our motion blur ends up being very inaccurate and borderline unusable when spinning objects are in view. Consider also that my motion blur method attempts to dilate velocities as necessary. As far as it is aware, 
Wheels are a lot of tiny elements moving in different directions very, very quickly. And if I did not have a backtracking stage to confirm velocities, the wheels would have been extremely dilated and their blur would extend in all directions. There are a few approaches that I am aware of that would solve this issue to varying degrees of success and robustness. The first one is simply turn the velocity rights off for rotating elements. This would yield a clean result at little to no cost, and the only drawback being that spinning elements would not have their velocity and feel captured very well. The second method, and there are a few ways that you can execute it, is to have multiple meshes at varying levels of blur for different speeds, and smoothly transition between them as the object you want to show the effect on speeds up. This method is a go-to, and it is used by many AAA games, including and not limited to GTA V and the way they do their planes, for example. Of course, you don't necessarily need to recreate new meshes for each speed range, and depending on the game and style you're going for, you may be able to get away with just transitioning the texture of the mesh to smeared versions of it, and call it a day. There are upsides and downsides to this method. You can imagine that the setup can be quite the work, as you have to create multiple assets that are specifically designed for that purpose and none other. In addition, they have to be designed with the right blurring and composition principles in mind, requiring an entire skill set to pull off believably. The strength of this method, however, is that a good set of assets and a good transition would yield what is probably the best looking and cleanest result. This is because not only do you have full control over the mesh's visual as a function of their speed, but you also gain from the robustness of a dedicated mesh as part of your rendering rather than needing to post-process a 2D image, usually with the object only partially visible. This is especially good if you still want to keep some details of the mesh stationary, like reflections and lighting. I shall say that although I would not cover this method further in this video, it is probably the best for this purpose if what you want is full artistic control and a clean result. Before the last method, honorable mentions. I'm sure some of you may suggest that instead of relying on a single velocity for the entire sampling process for each pixel, I can also sample the velocity at each of the sample positions as I get to them and update my blur direction to that new velocity. This is a valid idea to challenge, which is why I have. In one of my first iterations of the general motion blur implementations, I realized this exact thing and I put it together, expecting a much better result than the mess I was observing with rotating objects at the time. To my surprise, it did not change a bit. If anything, it seems to get worse. The reason for that has less to do with the concept and more to do with the way I mentioned that Godot does its velocities. Instead of giving me velocities that are tangent to whatever curve the pixel was following at that time, I'm getting velocities that point to the past position of that pixel, which is usually along the inside of the curve path. This fact, combined with the updating velocity approach, would result in a spiraling pattern that is just as bad if not worse than sampling along a single velocity throughout. But what about tangent velocities? Won't they provide you with a good result that would render all this hustle obsolete? To a degree, yes. Tangent velocities would provide you with a much closer estimation to the path you need to cover, and would produce a higher quality result. This does not make them a perfect solution in the slightest, however, as even then, you are sampling along discrete steps made of linear sections, which would inevitably accumulate an error over the ground truth. To mitigate this, you could increase the sample count per velocity distance, but even then, as rotation becomes more and more exaggerated, this becomes a less and less realistic of an approach, as the error accumulation would fail to satisfy basic visual accuracy requirements. Another honorable mention is a method that uses duplicates of the same mesh that are slightly transparent and vary in their rotation based on how many of them you use. It is a valid method, and it is equivalent to generating the ground truth, but the obvious drawbacks are the required extra meshes to render a smooth-looking result. Now comes the third option, and the one I have added to my general blur over the last few days, and that is procedurally blurring the mesh around the singular rotation axis and speed. This approach isn't unheard of, as it is used by Unreal Engine as well, as far as I'm aware. This is what it looks like in action. As you can see, the results don't look half bad, and are definitely a step up from the results achieved with the linear blur approach. Here is the same car scene from before, but now with the wheels blurred using this technique. 
The point behind this method is that instead of using velocity values to generate sample positions to blur along, we can use much more precise constants like the rotation axis, origin, and rotation speed of our object to construct samples along a curve that follows the exact diameter for each pixel. This means that we have the best sampling accuracy we can possibly achieve, resulting in a perfectly circular blur effect. In addition, this also means that we have the ability to blur along multiple rotations per frame instead of having the velocity buffer potentially think we are going in the other direction, as I mentioned before. A downside of this method is that it provides you with a heuristic estimation of the actual blur at best, resulting in artifacts in cases where the object is not entirely visible. Additionally, you get artifacts around the object's true silhouette as you have to fake its transparency by sampling the nearby background. Another limitation is that lighting effects also get radially blurred, which may not be desired. These issues are also inherent to the general motion blur implementation, so it's nothing unheard of in real-time motion blur standards. The main point in its favor, however, is that it allows you to apply this blur to any mesh you desire very easily. Before I tell you how to make your own, let's overview how it works. My implementation for radial blur does not operate in the post-process stage, but rather in the surface material stage. This allows any mesh to be blurred radially before the post process, which can add linear blur on top of that. For that to happen, we need a simpler mesh that would encapsulate the space that the mesh that we want to blur sweeps through as it rotates. If you want, you can choose a simpler cylinder, but for more accurate results, you may want to make a more detailed mesh yourself. Let's have a look at the shader behind the effect. I will drastically simplify it because it is not that polished to begin with. The general principle is that it uses the screen texture in creating the final color for the mesh, which is somewhat equivalent to performing a very local post-process effect within the mesh silhouette. First, I use the depth texture to get the world position of each pixel on that mesh. Then I orbit that world position around the axis of rotation for every sample I want to make. And then I sample from the screen texture with that rotated position. Lastly, I return the average of the samples as the final blurred pixel. Now for the setup. First you have to get the relevant add-ons, which I have added to my motion blur repositories. And since this method works in surface material and does not require the compositor effect implementation, it is compatible with previous versions of the engine, so I have made an add-on for version 4.2 as well. All will be linked in the description. We start with the mesh that we want to blur around the rotation axis. In this example, a propeller. In this case, I have made a simple mesh in Blender to envelop it as tightly as possible. You then start by getting a radial blur mesh scene and setting the mesh asset to be the enveloping mesh. Put that mesh as a sibling of the node that does the rotating and position it exactly where it needs to be around that mesh you want to blur to cover it fully. Then, set the target mesh on the radial blur mesh to be the node that is in charge of the rotating and select the correct axis for rotation and alignment. It may take some trial and error, but when you get it right, you should be ready to go. Now at this point, the radial blur mesh runs its own logic to extract rotational velocity along the relevant axis automatically, with the only drawback being that it has no idea if you made over half a turn in one direction or less than half a turn in the other direction, so it chooses the smallest distance. If you want to support larger rotation speeds per frame, all you have to do is add a signal named Rotation Velocity Signal on a script on the target node of the radial blur mesh and pass the true rotation velocity of the object through that signal each frame. The radial blur mesh would pick up on it automatically. The last video's success has driven me to follow through with this one. I hope you guys enjoyed it and have fun with my creations. Till next time.